It's a great pleasure to be here, although uh, I'm not going to be talking about a particularly pleasurable topic because uh, what I'd like to do is tell you why knowledgeable scientists are incredibly worried about the future of civilization and what knowledgeable scientists think we might be able to do about it. Uh, the basic problem is that humanity is faced with a series of existential threats, things that threaten uh, our ability to maintain a civilization, maybe even in some circumstances to persist as a species. Uh, and you're probably familiar with some of those threats. The one that gets the most publicity is, of course, climate disruption. Uh, we have recently in the United States had a beautiful example uh, where the warming of the planet and particularly the differential warming of the Arctic has led to a weakening of the circumpolar vortex, allowing blobs of cold air from the Arctic uh, to penetrate as far as Texas and cause great problems. And of course, uh, we've also seen in places like Australia and California and Siberia, uh, huge problems created by uh, a general drying of those areas as the climate disruption continues. And uh, the, the mess in Texas is also illuminated what's wrong with the social system in the United States uh, because uh, the moronic governor of Texas said the big problem was green energy when in fact the big problem is in part caused by Texas's overuse of fossil fuels, which uh, is adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, which in turn is warming the planet, which in turn is decreasing the polar uh, equator, equator gradient and leading to uh, the big problems in Texas. So climate disruption is a big issue, although most of the discussion of it doesn't hit what's really important. People think mostly I, of sea level rise, which is inevitable, is going to be, uh, it's happening now, uh, it's going to be really horrible uh, for people uh, in uh, many of the world's cities which are right on the seashore, but it's going to be slow enough you'll be able to walk away from it. On the other hand, you can't walk away from all food and the big problem with climate disruption is, of course, uh, it clobbers agriculture. Uh, and anybody, uh, and along with that, it clobbers parts of the agricultural system like pollinators uh, that are extremely important to our diets. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. All you have to be is a gardener or a tropical fish uh, enthusiast. And you know, uh, if you don't pay careful attention to the temperature, you end up with dead plants or dead black mollies or angelfish or whatever, uh, because all the organisms on the planet, including human beings, uh, have evolved to exist at a certain temperature range. And what we're doing is changing that range very, very rapidly. Uh, and so one of the prospects is that uh, we're going to become uh, much more marginal in our food supplies if we keep this rapid climate change going. And uh, you probably know that a lot of people are hungry today, that something close to 2 billion of the roughly 8 billion people on the planet are micronutrient malnourished, uh, which among other things weakens their immune systems uh, and uh, allows things like viruses to get going, and you may have heard of that also. So climate disruption is one of the big existential threats. Uh, tied to it is what I just mentioned is the loss of biodiversity. That is, we are utterly dependent on the other uh, plants, the other animals, and the microorganisms of the planet for our existence, and we are wiping out their populations uh, at a very rapid rate. Uh, catastrophic declines in things we observe, like the number of birds in North America, uh, but also uh, in lots of things we don't observe, uh, which do lots of things for us. That is, for example, uh, the native bees that pollinate a lot of our crops and are disappearing and so on, although the average person doesn't know that they're disappearing. So uh, climate uh, change is one thing. Uh, loss of biodiversity is another existential threat. Toxification of the planet 
is yet another existential threat because uh, we are, everybody is getting dosed uh, with a, a series of synthetic organic chemicals that we use for all sorts of things, uh, most obviously in terms of loss of biodiversity, uh, the silent spring phenomenon, uh, we kill off a lot of organisms by overusing pesticides. Uh, we make our own lives uh, much more tricky uh, by misusing uh, antibiotics, uh, and we are uh, using fossil fuels to create plastics, which are now jamming into the ocean so much so that it's estimated that by the middle of the century, there'll be more plastic in the oceans than fishes. Uh, the plastics get ground up into tiny little fragments, get coated with persistent organic pollutants, that is poisons, uh, which then can enter the human food chain, uh, cross the blood-brain barrier, and you get little bits of poison-coated plastic in your brain. Um, a lot of people think that was the real problem with Trump, but we're not sure. Uh, so toxification is a gigantic problem. Uh, it might help solve the population problem uh, because human sperm counts are plummeting around the world, uh, but it's not yet clear how far they're going to go or how fast they're going to go. Uh, but that is another potential existential problem. Uh, we're, also <clears throat> we're also losing our soils and groundwater, which are essential to agriculture. There are many, many threats uh, to our entire food system. And the food system contributes in its own way because somewhere close to a third of the greenhouse gases that are changing the climate that the food system is so dependent upon uh, actually come from running the food system. We use a huge amount of fossil fuel uh, to uh, grow our crops. So we're basically, we spend a lot of time and energy uh, converting oil into potatoes uh, and doing things like that. So uh, we have a, a series of really threatening problems beyond the ones that you probably thought of, like uh, the possibility, the likelihood that there are going to be more pandemics. Uh, and we've been very lucky uh, with the SARS COVID 2 uh, pandemic in that the scientific community has come together very rapidly and produced a set of vaccines, which, at least at the moment, uh, seem to have the potential for doing the job and at least greatly reducing uh, the problems with, with this new virus. But we're doing all sorts of things like wiping out biodiversity that in complicated ways uh, make the chances of more nasty viruses, more nasty pandemics much larger. You want to always remember uh, that human beings' infectious diseases uh, come from other animals. There are variants in pathogens, viruses, and bacteria, and fungi uh, that in most cases are already present in other animals. And as you wipe out the big animals, which we're doing first, so that things like rats become more common, uh, it turns out they're also wonderful uh, transmitters of the their own diseases to human beings. And uh, I, I always remember that my old colleague, Josh Lederberg, a great scientist and Nobel laureate, who invented uh, sex and bacteria. The bacteria have been grateful ever since, but uh, Josh once said that human survival uh, is not preordained. Uh, that's why we have viruses. So uh, something to pay attention to. Uh, hopefully uh, the Biden administration will restore uh, some of the things that uh, the Trump administration destroyed that are designed to warn us of coming pandemics. <clears throat> The basic cause of all this has been obvious for a very long time. Uh, one way to put it is it's the scale of the human em uh, enterprise. Uh, there are just too many of us. Uh, each one of us on average uh, consumes too much. Uh, and we use uh, malign technologies in many cases to service that consumption. Uh, and we uh, deal with it very unevenly, which co creates other problems for us. So population size, overpopulation, overconsumption, 
uh, inequality, bad choice of technologies and social arrangements uh, have produced a gigantic mess uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, that mess is almost brand new in evolutionary terms. In other words, for most of the uh, uh, roughly 300,000 years that modern homo sapiens, modern people, have been on the planet, uh, we were small group animals living as hunter-gatherers. Uh, it wasn't until our population became large enough that people decided to start settling down and practicing agriculture that the real problems started. Agriculture and settling down, uh, among other things, allowed uh, a family to raise more food than it needed. And that led to specialization to uh, not just farmers and not just hunter-gatherers and farmers, uh, but uh, soldiers, priests, mechanics, scientists, and so on. Uh, which allowed us to develop a whole series of technologies, um, the agricultural rev in the agricultural revolution, uh, that led then to the industrial revolution, uh, which, it, as you can see in this list of things I've gone over, uh, is really what's responsible for most of the existential threats. Uh, maybe the most serious, of course, uh, and the one that has the greatest potential uh, for ending us as a species is the so-called mutually assured imbecility. That is, uh, the Russians, the Americans, and some other countries having so many nuclear weapons that if they use them, it could alter the climate and the planet so much that humanity might actually die out. Well, that's one of the great triumphs of our, uh, of our uh, two revolutions, our agricultural revolution and our industrial revolution. Uh, the agri revolution also led to uh, economic inequality. Uh, when you had to carry everything around with you when you were a hunter-gatherer, it was hard to become super rich. Uh, and uh, it also <coughs> allowed things like slavery, uh, xenophobia, and so on. In a, in a summary, we're basically a small group animal that has developed a way of getting gigantic groups, uh, but we haven't learned how to deal with the gigantic groups. We did fine uh, when there was 50 to 100 people in each group, uh, but subsequently things have really gone uh, downhill. And uh, so and an another major thing is that we uh, evolved our nervous systems to detect rapid changes in our surroundings. If somebody threw a rock at your head, uh, you wanted to be able to detect it against a still background. And you can do a little test for yourself uh, by uh, moving your head rapidly from side to side and you'll notice the room stays still. If you take the video on your cell phone and do this with it and then watch the recording, uh, you'll get dizzy because your brain has evolved to get information from so, uh, from nerves that tell you your head is moving and it keeps the background steady uh, so that we're very, very good at detecting a car swerving towards us or a handsome person of the opposite uh, gender coming towards you and so on. But we're really lousy at seeing changes in the background because our minds were designed to keep the background steady. And one of the horrors today, of course, is what we need to do is see the gradual changes in the background. We need to see uh, the gradual increase in temperature taken by a thermometer high up on a mountain in Hawaii. We need to register on the increasing numbers of nuclear weapons in various places. The, the things that threaten us, the toxification and so on, are gradual changes in our background and we're designed to see rapid changes against a stationary background. And that makes it very, very difficult uh, for us to uh, uh, adjust to the changes we have to make if we're going to survive and keep our civilization going. Uh, it's uh, a, a small group animal just hasn't really adjusted and hasn't faced a lot of things. For example, scientists keep telling people more facts about the environment 
but most people don't pay any attention to facts. They come from small groups uh, where what they value is the opinions of their buddies, uh, the, uh, what the uh, hunt leader says, and so on. They want to be admired by their friends, and the emotions play a huge role uh, in, our, uh, in our societies, which tells us that if we're going to change our behavior, uh, which we certainly have to do, uh, we're going to have to do a lot of things like uh, promote soap operas with the right messages and so on, because just we've proven, scientists have proven that expanding uh, on the factual knowledge of people does not normally change their behavior. They've done actual tests taking climate deniers, giving them even more scientific information about the climate. It makes them more solid deniers. Uh, and until we face that just producing the science is not going to produce an evidence-based world, uh, we're going to continue to be in trouble. Because our basic task to get out of the bind we're in uh, is going to involve another revolution, what I like to call a survival revolution, uh, that will uh, uh, be of the same scale of change in our societies, uh, in our culture, our non-genetic information, as was the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do individually to help protect civilization. Uh, one of the the best, for example, in a rich country like ours is have one fewer child. Having one fewer child is the equivalent of giving up driving 23 times. Uh, so there's a lot you can do individually, but actually the main chore is going to be to do things politically, uh, to, for example, join the mob, mahb.stanford.edu, mahb.stanford.edu. It's a group of citizens trying to get together and find ways to change civil society uh, to make uh, it more possible to preserve uh, our civilization, which a lot of us think would be worth uh, preserving. So uh, the big task is to figure out how to do it. In other words, scientists have really pointed out what needs to be done. We know we have to stop uh, uh, burning fossil fuels very, very fast. Uh, we know that we have to stop um, uh, destroying our soils and overusing our groundwater. We know we have to gradually lower the size of the human population, do it gradually, do it humanely. Uh, we know one of the main ways to do that is to give women uh, equal rights and equal opportunities with men uh, and give everybody uh, access to modern contraception and backup abortion. We know we have to do those things. We don't know how the hell to get them done. Uh, and that's where the social scientists, the artists, uh, the uh, uh, people who are planning TV and so on come in. Uh, we're really moving from being uh, in the hands of the biophysical scientists who have told us what the problems are and created many of the problems uh, to civil society uh, trying to figure out how to get the things done that are going to get us out of this ghastly mess uh, that we're gra rapidly uh, slipping into. So uh, I hope you will all uh, join the mob, mahb.stanford.edu, and listen to the other people, the wonderful lineup of people that are going to be in this symposium. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.